Hello, everyone, and welcome to Creative Live. Welcome back to Creative Live. I am your host, Kenna Klosterman, and today we are recording another episode of our podcast, We Are Photographers, where we wow. talk to photographers and filmmakers uh, from all over the world, bring you directly to their homes now, from my home now, um, as we are this year. We're recording now uh, at the end of October 2020. So as we like to do, be sure to let us know in the chat room if you're on Creative Live com slash TV. You can click on the chat icon and that will allow you to interact with us while we are live. And if you're watching on socials as well, be sure to drop in where it is that you're tuning in from. We love to hear those shout outs. So I am super excited to bring on today's guest, Andre Leroux. Uh, he's coming to me all the way from Brooklyn. He is a Jamaican born photographer and visual artist. Uh, he was an Adobe creative resident where he was exploring was. stories across this country. He has he continues to work on the set of W. Camus Bell's United Shades. We're going to talk about that. Um, he continues to, he seeks the truth in each human being. And that is what really shows through in his portraits. Uh, we'll continue to talk about that. Um, he uh, received his first Minolta at age 15, and uh, he wants to pay it forward with all the knowledge that he has. And he also, I'm going to ask you about this, Andre, uh, is known for his viral treat about how to photograph darker skin tones that went to at Annie Leibovitz. So be sure to follow Andre on Behance and on his Instagram at Andre if you're not already. Welcome uh, Andre. Thank you so much for being here. Dude, first of all, thank you so much. That was like a really involved intro that I'm impressed that you like studied, no teleprompter. Like I did this as a professional before, but I'm blown away. Um I was actually looking around to see if the Minolta was in plain sight, but it is not. I can only see Canon AE1 and I didn't want to have an incorrect product placement. So um yeah no, I mean just as a quick quick like Thank you. Um, you know, Creative Live, uh, a ton of things, Skillshare, all these, uh, Linda, all these companies do a really good job and are particularly helpful right now um, during quarantine when we're feeling really self-conscious about our self-worth and also want to learn new things. So having things that allow us the ability to learn things quickly is really, really vital. So, you know, just take a minute and really appreciate all the hard work you did to get people to the point where they can just try to learn something specialized you know like that's not a small thing um and we're really thankful for things like that like i think um no single creator even if they're self-taught has gone without any resources so shout out to creative life for that well thank you for that andre and i know i mean the concept of self-taught is still like self-taught is self-directed learning you know and there's still like a you know somebody that you're continuing to learn from uh which you know now you are a part of, you are part of the, you know, creators and folks that are out there teaching, educating, um, whether that's your, you know, your tutorials on Behance, um, last week was Adobe Max, uh, your oh, Lightroom yeah. tutorials. Uh, so let's just start by talking about what are you most excited about right now, uh, whether that's in terms of your work, your life, uh, open floor. Well, I'm going to go and say you have like the most Pinterest looking background. I'm so sorry. I'm like, showing off my shoes. Um, this probably is actually going to stay here. It's just a place for things to go. I'm in like a new little closet office that I'm yeah, very you, happy. You just to moved, keep. right? Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, what I'm excited about, it's a couple things. Um, you know, I just voted. Voting was exciting. Um, I think that there's something very calming about having a single action that you can have to do something that you need. Um, and just to be able to like settle and do that has been really nice. I think we've had a lot of moments um, in the last, I think throughout our entire lives, but especially in the last four years where there have been moments that have been overwhelming um, for people that's in their identity based on whether, it's, I mean, coronavirus was the obvious peak of this, but there are so many things along the way that I think have reminded us how fragile our lives are. And so something that helps us decide what kind of government we want is actually kind of exciting, even if it's, if, we're, if you're happy with what you have, or if you want to try something else or do something else. Um, I think I'm really excited to vote, or I was excited to vote, that's over now. Um, other things I'm excited about, um, I don't know. I think this year is going to be interesting. I think that we've all finally settled that we're not coming out of this in 2020. Like, you know, the year is a wash and it's about to be November in a day or two. And although it's sad that we can't go out for Halloween and I am wearing my sweater to look like Yogi Bear, um, I think that in that settlement, um, we've had the opportunity to 
figure out ways to like promote our online community and to be actively a part of it. Like I've never seen more email chains and group texts come back off that we're all kind of okay with. Um, and I think that's helpful because over time in a globalized society, we're not going to be able to stay with all the people that maybe we met in New York or we grew up in Fort Lauderdale with or whatever. And so getting um, new ways to interact and be consistent about it is exciting. So I think that's, that's really exciting to me right now. So what are some of the ways, I mean, you and I first met, I think it's four years ago when Creative Live, we were doing our photo week in New York City and yeah. we connected with Pursuit of Portraits, uh, yes, which you were part of part of um, orga helping organize and get the community out for. And, you know, that that was the days when we would have these big photo meetups. So what have you seen with regard to community um, in, in this year and how it's shifted to online? Like at where have you, in, in addition to sort of your personal contacts, um, where have you seen people being successful in terms of connecting and learning from each other? So, you know, I. I, I don't, I'm not really old, like I, I, but I'm 29 and I've really started to feel old. Like my friends are like, do you want to like be on TikTok or like get on Twitch? I'm like, no, nah, I'm all right, man. I don't need, I don't have for all that. Um, but the point, reason I want to call out Twitch specifically is I didn't understand that streams were being used. So earlier in the year when I hadn't really streamed before, unless it had been through like an Adobe related thing that someone else had set up for me, how for a lot of people, streams were a place where it was almost like seeing the same movie you've seen again. Like, yeah, you might see something different, but often it's just a place to be with other people that are like-minded. Um, and so for one of my friends, like, as they are starting to discover their gender identity, their streams are just about writing a novel. And when they get to points that are confusing, like, it's just kind of soft music playing their writing and people are in there chatting. And then they'll say, oh, hey, I'm having a hard time with this character. Let me describe it to you. What do you think about it? Um, and it all of a sudden is now this space where it's like, collaborative learning and collaborative action. Um, and it's one of the few places you can feel safe. Like, I mean, you go outside and you feel stressed whether you have a mask on or who's gonna wear a mask or where you can go. And so I really do wanna call out Twitch, Behance, um, StreamYard, like all these places that have made it like easier. Cause I think I think Zoom is Zoom has gotten exhausting because um, off, we're not opting into having our video on. But when you go into a stream, you're not having your video on, you're just kind of group watching something. Um, I also want to call out like the quarantine, all these little quarantine groups I'm in, like um, for photographers to talk about work or people wanting to learn about photography, or um, I'm in one with some of my friends that's just a quarantine movie group. So we just write films that we want to see and talk about. Um, I think it's more just a, for a deeper connection to the communities I already have. But I think the cool thing is you have an idea and people just try it. My friend Quentin made this Slack group called Hella Creative. And it's mostly like tech people. And so one of their big things is that they got a lot of tech companies to um, acknowledge Juneteenth as a holiday going forward. But just in it, like they've been doing happy hours once or twice a week, every single week, um, have had conversations about wealth, about growth. And like, I think in, in the lack of interaction we've had, we've had more time to learn stuff. And so there's just so many people that are figuring out ways to even organize digitally among us, Animal Crossing. Like there's so many ways that, have been like, I think I wouldn't have given a second thought before because I've really, in previous years, really worshipped that go, 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 go mentality of like traveling or shooting or whatever. Um, but there's there's a lot of really tender and calm and helpful things that um, can be embraced right now and have been. It's a, it's a beautiful sentiment. And I, and, and it, it, yeah, I mean, I think that the sense of community, whether it's you know, with people used to work in WeWorks just so that they could be near people. And so mm -hmm. like relating that to Twitch, you know, or, or these places where you can kind of, it, it doesn't even matter if you're not like in active conversation, but you just feel less isolated. And, um, and that is, that is a beautiful thing. Um, you have been working. Uh, I was, oh, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. I follow you on Twitter. I mean, on, well, I do follow you on Twitter and Instagram. And uh, I, the other day you had um, a post with your, you know, your story, your pictures in the New York times. And it was, that said like, it never gets old. Um, what does it? Yes, there you go. Well, congratulations on that. Uh, how, tell me about the first time that you got published, whether it was the New York times or, you know, something that then like, take me back to when it kind of clicked for you, like, 
oh, this is legit. Like I, you mm. know, I, I'm doing it. Like it's, and not that just getting published is, is doing it, but oh, it, no, it no, is no, a no. milestone, you know? Yeah. Let me say something. So um, just on the editorial front, um, almost all the editorial that I've worked on and my friends have worked on, they pay you less than other things, but I think there is an ability to it because of some of our oldest institutions. And I think particularly right now, as we discuss what counts as news and what doesn't, it's a great pride for me to work with things like the New York Times, um, organizations that have been around for over 100 years and have like delivered news to us. I was a journalist major in college, um, and so I know how hard that job is. And so for my friends that one of my good friends from college um, works in crime reporting in, in, the Palm, in Palm Beach, the Palm Beach Post, and like she is just at the courthouse every day. Um, that's not an easy job. So. I think the first time it really clicked for me, um, I'm going to go three run. Uh, in high school, I was a drama nerd. And so I we had this program with the Sun Sentinel. I'm from Fort Lauderdale, and Sun Sentinel is our local paper. Sun Sentinel and the Miami Herald was two papers down there. And they had a program called Team Link, which is like a teen magazine or a newspaper that ran like once a week. Um, and in it, they had a section where you could review um, other high school theaters, just like productions. Um, and so that was something I really enjoyed doing. And through like a like a county program, we'd go to other schools and review their um, review their shows. And so I remember the first time I got published was um, for this show I saw in Coral Springs, and it was so exciting to like see my like 300 words printed somewhere. And it was just it was cool to feel validated in that way, like my words had value. And then second, um, I got into photography like around then when I was in high school, but in college, the first photo I had published, it was my sophomore year. Um, I went to a concert um, with my girlfriend then, Paige Milch, shout out to Paige, in, in Portland, I hope you're doing all right. And I took a photo um, that was like such a college photo. It was like, you know, at a show and there's like, um, like LED pink lights pushing and someone held up like a little heart. And the way our college paper worked is for Independent Florida Alligator, super shout out to that. Um, you could send in photos um, as features, and if they had like spots or gaps, they would just put them in. And they liked the photo editor liked that photo. I'd been trying to submit some stuff, and they ran it the paper next day, and I was like super excited. Um, <laughs> and then from there, I started to be like, oh, like there's value. So it's just really cool. Like I I tried to save them. I don't have all of them, but in college, I saved a lot of my um, college papers just because I thought it was really cool to keep. But the first one I think here that really mattered was. Um, uh, during my residency year, I got to photograph Karamo um, from Queer Eye for Anxi Magazine. So Anxi is like kind of editorial, but it's more loosely editorial. It's a um, publication that's focused on mental health. And they reached out to me because I knew some friends of friends. I photographed one thing for them. And then the following year, I photographed, since the biannual twice a year, I photographed Karamo for this, this piece about masculinity. And it was super interesting to me just to meet someone who's really famous at that point. But we got to spend, like, just as a quick sign note for anyone that wants to shoot celebrities, my biggest note to you is practice, practice, practice. No celebrity gives you longer than, like, a second. <laughs> like, every every celebrity I've shot isn't like, oh, I'm shooting with Andre. Let me, like, give you two hours. Like, for Karama, I remember, like, I had to, I flew into Kansas City. There was no direct flight to Kansas City. So I took um, a bus from my then apartment to the R train to... Penn Station, to Philly, to the train, to fly to Kansas City. It was madness. Got there at like two in the morning, got up early, scouted all day, and then was supposed to have two hours with them, and it turned into seven minutes. I am not joking. Um, and so uh, that one meant a lot to me because it was seven minutes, but I didn't rush. I was calm. I was exhausted, but it didn't matter. Um, I think that one thing that I'm thankful for over time is like I remember when I first moved here and I was living in my godfather's attic, he'd always tell me like he remember he said
um, were getting published and some memorable photo shoots and, you know, and what it, what it means just to, um, to be in the moment and to be grounded in, um, in, in the time that you have and being, you know, aware of your craft so that you can, when you are photographing celebrities, um, just kind of be in the zone. I, I want to then talk about your style and how you do connect with people uh, because mm -hmm. you're, you, you do editorial, you do commercial work, uh, but your kind of the essence is this connection that you are able to create with the humans that you are, are photographing. And so, um, and, and you know, what you talk about even in your bio is to see the truth in each human being. And, and so how do you see the truth? How do you, is it something about you and your energy? Um, is it something people can learn? Tell me how you accomplish that. I mean, I, I think that saying seeing the truth is like, an, is what I aspire to. Um, sometimes I do a bad job, but I do really try to, like, for example, I know you're going to ask me about this, so I'll show a couple like examples. The first one is, Working on the show of United Shades is actually a really good reminder that I don't actually matter all that much. Like, uh, working, like, I think a lot as a photographer, if you're not shooting editorial, if you're like a commercial photographer, you are running the set. Everyone is, everyone is, you're important. Like, you are the star of the show and nailing this image. Like, although your clients there, your producers are trying to speed you up, you are the engine that makes everything go. When you work on stuff that isn't, as that can go on without you it's a nice reminder that like you're a part of something larger um and i think one good thing about coronavirus has been the reminder of our need to um lean on each other properly and so i think discovering truth starts with a couple of realizations from self is like a that i'm very fragile b that um like there's a david foster david foster waller's david foster waller speech called this is water where he talks about um, how to think. Um, he says this thing where he was like, you know, for whatever reason, when other people describe how they feel, it's every everything that you see is happening through your eyes and in your world and in your narration. And other people's emotions are so foreign, they have to be explained to you, right? And so if you come at it with the realization that like everyone is just as sad and freaked out and scared and upset and hungry and doesn't want to be in this grocery store as much as I do, um, then it like usually helps you listen a little bit longer and maybe ask yourself, ask that person the question that you wish other people asked you. Um, I think that it's really important to me to try to connect with my subjects early um, and just try to make sure we're on the same page. Like, yeah, crime was seven minutes, but we had two minutes in the elevator and we talked about how he was like, I remember when I used to have long hair like yours. And I was like, okay, you're still more handsome and famous than me. So I'm not sure what matters here. Um, no, I just think that like, like jokes aside, I think that it starts with just wanting to, to understand that you're not like the most important person and practicing a lot because, um, you need to make sure that people trust that you can deliver. So the first step is to make sure that, um, they trust that you see them and they see you. And second, that when it's time to play, like you're ready to go. Um, Dana Scruggs is a photographer who's incredible. I don't know if you've had her yet, but you should have her on. She had this, I think it was a tweet where she was talking about how she shot that Essence cover with P. Diddy full family. And she said that P. Diddy selected her specifically to do this. And when she, she said when he came in with his family, the first thing he yelled, he, said, he was like, hey, you ready? And she was like, what? And he was like, I selected you specifically. I want to make sure you're ready. Like, are you, you're not scared or anything, are you? Um, and it's like, if you hire any contractor, right? If I hired some guy to come in here and hang stuff on my ceiling, he's just like, oh, I mean, I'd be like, yo, get out of here, bro. Um, and so, you know, your work, the good news is like, I have enough work now where people see that I care about people. So they're going to trust me and it kind of compounds on itself. But when you're starting, like for me, it was just about taking the same photos of the same people over and over until I learned something else about them. Um, people can really reveal things to you when you are quiet enough to listen, um, and you give them a space to just feel a little bit uncomfortable, but still directed. Um, that's kind of what I would say. But yeah, I think it really starts to just understand like, yeah, I'm not the center of the universe. And what helps me is that um, since I'm an immigrant, um, I mean, my family is cool, but they don't really care anything that I'm doing. <laughs> like, they, it does, I'm like, oh, I got a photo of the times. They're like, okay, cool. Like, you going to help us pull these weeds? Like, <laughs> like, nobody cares about this. Like, yeah, yeah, like, I'm, great. Like, congratulations. But like, like <laughs> we still got to go do this thing. 
there are so many things, Andre, and my mind was like, what do I, what do I ask him about next? Because there's a, a lot of layers in, in that story. Um, and, and so I want to, I want to talk about, you know, be, having worried. Jamaican parents or, you know, being born there, raised in mm-hmm. Florida. But before that, this, the, um, the layers of sensitivity and the ability to allow somebody to, uh, to hold space for somebody to both be uncomfortable and then shift into being able to, um, to trust you and to, for you to direct them. Because I think that is like what people need when you're, nobody wants to be in front of a camera. And so it's this like constant directing of people so that they stop thinking and connect with you. Um, and I want to touch on uh, recently you did a project with the organization to write love on her arms. Um, yeah, shout out. And 15 year old Andre that was there. You know, you do stuff and like you were like, man, if I do what I was going to do this when I was 15, 15 years old, the first show that they, they came out at a Switchfoot show, they just made the shirt, they just come out. And I was at that show as like a youth group kid with other church kids, so excited. And they were came out and then we all had their shirts and stuff. So it was, I got that email from them and I was like, get out of town. Wow. So, so. Tell us about, and people can go to your Instagram oh, yeah. and, and and see these images. Um, but um, tell us about the organization and like uh, what that project meant to you because it's um, yeah yeah. So to write, to write love on her arms, which is weirdly a lot harder to say than I would assume. To write love on her arms, to write love on her arms is an organization that started. Uh, I graduated high school in two thousand nine. I want to say like two thousand six or seven. They started. Um, and they sold like merchandise and stuff to raise money for mental health resources. Um, because you remember in 2007, nobody was talking about no mental health, no sir. They were like, Yo, you are crazy, stop being crazy. Like, <laughs> that was it. Um, I, you know, I even have a moment where I remember saying something really stupid to a girl, a, a, like a friend of mine in, co- in high school who was saying she's having a hard time and about medication. I just didn't understand, so I was like, Why are you taking it? It's stupid, like, just very not empathetic. and. Um, I'm happy that I've learned more, but um, to write Lover Arms, their whole goal is to um, both reduce stigmas on, on mental health and um, be able to help people pay for it. And so they sell stuff, they um, promote events, and they ask people to share well, you know, why their lives are worth living. And so um, basically they reached out. <laughs> I emailed them back photos of me as like a 140 pound or 160 pound high schooler wearing their shirt like just looking so happy um and just told them what it meant but basically the word the, the project was called um it was called like life worth living and i wrote a blog post for them called no moments are worthless and the goal of it was like one cool thing about doing some commercial work is you get paid enough money that when someone's like hey we can pay you like no money or we have no money but this is important like anti-suicide you're like yeah okay And so the goal with the project was to um, photograph people that I had previously worked with um, on commercial jobs, but instead, like, ask them places where they feel safe or with whom they feel safe and capture capture them there, which is actually pretty simple. It was essentially a portrait project, but I tried to explicitly photograph it at sunrise or sunset just to make sure that I had that really strong, hopeful light, like, Kind of, I thought about the way that I, I wanted to photograph things when I was really learning photography, like no strobes, none of that stuff. And I just wanted it to be reflective of like maybe all the things I've learned from when I was 14, 15, 16 to 29. And like, I think in some ways it was like a little bit of a love letter to all the places photography has taken me and like the roundabout way that I've gotten back to really what it came down to, which is like, you're seen and you're important. Um, there's a photographer, Lauren Larson. She's a fine art photographer and a wedding photographer. And I met her many, many years ago when I was still in high school. Um, just, I met her husband because of something, and we happened to chat. And then I was with Instagram friends for a long time, and now we're good friends. And um, she told me in high school, read this book, um, Camera Lucida by Roland Bars. And he talks about, in the book, the only line I remember is essentially that a photograph freezes a moment in time. And um, there's a nobility to it, but also, like, it, they can create a, a ton of excess. And the nobility starts with the idea that the moment that's frozen is completely true um and so when you take an image like making sure that you're chasing that truth is super super valuable and vital and so that's the thing that i always think about is like what truth am i chasing and um being able to do something like that with people i care about was fascinating and i was honestly super surprised with how how much what responses i received back and even from the people that i asked 
I had friends that were like, my brother killed himself. And I was like, I've known you for years and didn't even know that that was a thing. Um, and it just, it felt, it felt good to just work on that, especially in this time when you're, I'm afraid to be around other people. Well, it's such an important um, organization and, and oh. I had no idea what a, what a full circle in terms of you being 15 and being, you know, already buying their merch and supporting it without sort of the true understanding personally. Oh, no, what, not at all. What I it, just thought it was cool. Right, right. Yeah. And what do you think it is that has um, changed in society that we are now able to talk about mental health? This is going to be a weird thing to say, but if you look at like how like rap music has changed, like when I was, or no, that this is, I'm going to be very careful. Rap music has changed in that what was the most popular thing in 2005, I think early 2000s was a very like capitalism focused, like if you look at rap music as like, as rap music goes, the music industry goes, the music industry goes, culture goes, as culture goes, the reflective of society. So um, we're, we're looking at like Shake Your Tail Feather, we're looking at like Big Pimpin', we're looking at Aereo Codes, like a lot of songs that are really fun, but um, don't really talk about how, you know, what we're thinking and feeling, right? And to think that like who's supposed to be at the top of uh, the game as musicians now, we're spending a lot more time, in my opinion, and maybe what I'm consuming now, being very reflective of like kind of deep pain. Like think about how well Kid Cudi's first album was received, where he talked explicitly about just drug use to deal with like how he feels um we're more aware of mental health right now because we can all admit that we're having a traumatic experience as a country as a world right now like we're dis we're distrusting people that we would walk by and say what's up to before like we're washing all our groceries like everything is all of a sudden super scary and so i think being able to admit that you're stressed um has had a new value and i think we've shifted our public discourse in a way that's more much more helpful um, and makes people, makes people feel less alone, which kind of goes back to that idea that, like, if I feel this alone, everything, like, you, you, know, you watch Scrubs? Uh, used to. It's been, it's been a while, but yeah, yeah. I doubt he's watching this, but if anyone knows Zach Braff, tell him I said I appreciate him dearly. Um, one thing that's really cool about JD and Scrubs is the fact that he monologues every episode, um, and then occasionally other people monologue it, is a reminder that, like, oh, no, I also think this way. And I think so much of that is what's important in art, especially mental health, is like, oh, like, I think I'm absolutely bonkers and no one thinks like I do. Oh, wait a minute. Okay, and we can talk about this. And there's like a validity in being seen, right? And that kind of goes back to all of this. But like, how do you how do you be seen um, and how do you be patient? I love that um, about that JD character because you're right. I mean, we all kind of walk around with this inner monologue and that can yeah. either make us crazy or make us do brilliant things, you know, that, and, and so I, I'm curious, we're kind of talking about art and, and creativity and, and how that gets people through these challenging times. Um, and, and sort of, like you said, like the country going through a collective trauma, uh, yeah. the world, the, the world going through a collective trauma, uh, have, world. have you, what have you seen in terms of how art has um, shifted or, or, you know, what, what have you seen this year that has changed for you? Uh, do you know the artist or the Instagram account people I've loved? No. Um, it's by this woman, Carissa Potter, who lives in the Bay. And she just has these like really lovely drawings and paintings and illustrations that are just about like, just exactly how everyone feels right now. Um, Is it pe I think people I love? People I love. P people I love. Uh, okay. People I V E love. Yeah. Okay. Um, it's been actually really interesting because I think even people that work steady. So first of all, our concept of what a steady job is has gone out the window because people got furloughed from jobs I didn't even know could like go bankrupt. <laughs> Like, jobs are open, like, you're good for eternity. We're like, oh, no, yeah, our job is, is gone. And I think in some way that's further val validated the freelancer artist's, like, lifestyle because now it's the I, entire idea that, I mean, some creative folks have denied themselves is, like, well, you know, what happens if, you know, I need something? And you realize, oh, no, we're all in the same boat <laughs> um, work-wise. So first I've seen, like, a validation of art 
um, and that lifestyle. Second, and with the additional time, I've seen people try some new things. Um, some portrait photographers have been doing object photography, product photography. Some illustrators have just been like peeling back the veil and showing us their process. Like shout out to Laura Sefnick and Jing Wei. Um, there's just a lot of really, really lovely things. Um, and I think that in that receiving of artists, well, I'm just gonna like sit up a little bit. Um, you've seen more art and I weirdly haven't seen, I personally haven't seen like a big drop in, um, in the work from the people that I follow. I'll also say that um, artists of color have like finally gotten a slightly longer moment than usual. And I hope that it doesn't go away. Um, I think that that validity is super important because you just, you don't, you're not making art to make everybody, to make other people happy, but you need a platform for people to see it. Um, and so just organizations and people realizing that they've lacked the diversity, um, the diversity of being able to say like, hey, here's a non-binary person of color and no one has ever cared about what this person has to say before. And so we need to go and do a better job of making that space has been the most exciting thing. Um, because I think that like when you pursue concepts of anti-racism, your two goals are to make being racist have negative consequences and being, being, make being anti-racist have positive consequences. And the first one is just increasing our visibility. Um, I guess this isn't exactly art, but another example is look how well the WNBA has done during this period. Like their viewership is up a ton. Um, people are like, it took people not have not having things to watch to say, oh, this is basketball that I should watch. I shouldn't just be stupid about it. Oh, wow, these women know how to play basketball? Ooh, I should be watching this the whole time. And so sometimes it's just a thing of like making the platform available. Well, or to your point, oh, this this non-binary black photographer is really talented. Oh, like, you know, it, it, it's... Oh, I shouldn't just hire them for this one one-off thing. It's like, come on, man. Like, what do you think this is? There's right. a ton of value in it. And like, um, I, you know, the other day, Lightroom has been working really hard on this. I saw them post some work from a non-binary, um, I think, Latinx creator, and they got a ton of negative comments. And instead of turning the comments off, what they did was they, they pinned all the positive ones, and then they kept posting the work. And I was like, you see, like, I know it sounds silly, but <sighs> just going back to Roland Bars, taking a snapshot is important to validate this moment in time and this moment in time may never happen again. And I pray to, I pray it doesn't happen again, but it's important that we don't forget these things. As we take our photographs, we see our illustrations, our writings, um, as we see paintings and drawings from this period of time, we need to remember exactly how this made us feel. Because if we don't, and we get back to something where we're not prepared for, I mean, no one can, could have been prepared for this, but not remotely prepared for this. Um, and how it would make us feel, how it will affect the economy, like that will do a support a detriment in the future. So I think that um, I've artists have been stepping up in this way to just make all sorts of things. Like Red Gaskell, awesome creator. I don't know if you know him. You should follow him. Um, red, like the color red, G A S K E L L. Um, he did this thing when he was getting as much work, where he was just trying to recreate some of his favorite commercials in his apartment. And like talking about how some of the special effects were hard, like even that like iPhone commercial where you like shake the box and you like try to slow it down and do all these things, or like I'm try trying to create the scene for my favorite film. Like sometimes it's just as simple as that, like documentation, joy, and honesty are like the three main tenets of art. And like I've just seen people just chasing that right now. Doc, I'm writing this down: documentation, joy, and artistry. Um, you... Sorry, documentation, joy, and honesty. Honesty. All right. Yep. Notes to self. That's beautiful. Uh, and, and makes me think. Um, talk to me That's about, good. yeah. <laughs> talk to me about the, your Adobe creative residency, um, oh, for people yeah. that aren't familiar with what that means, what that is, uh, how, how you got the residency or yeah, and, yeah, yeah. Yeah, more no, so, no, inter I'm more so interested question. in like, what it's you did during it. What I did yeah. With it. Okay, so first of all, um, all love to the following people, Julia Tion, Libby Nichelau, and um, Heidi Voltner. So inside of Adobe, they have a bajillion teams. It is like just the, the just such a large organization. But um, somewhere along the way, um, there was an idea that there should be more community support from Adobe for emerging artists. And so <clears throat> I'm going to actually go out of my way to say this, but um, they 
for the first year, it was Kelly Anderson and Becky Simpson. The year before me, it was Craig Winslow, Sarah Dietschy, Christine Heron, and Sid Weiler. And then our year was myself, Andre LaRoe, um, Jessica Bellamy, Chelsea Burton, Natalie uh, Liu, Rosa Kamimir, and Julia Nimke. And there have been some since then. But the idea of the residency is, you know, right when you're on that cusp of, like, you kind of know what you're doing now, but you need, like, some opportunity to work on things. Um, we're going to help you by paying you a salary, helping you pay for your pro project costs, giving you a computer, and just letting you go work. Throughout the year, we're going to have you test some products. Um, you're going to give us feedback. You're going to show up on our lives. But for the most part, your time is yours. And to be honest, it's like low key stressful because all of a sudden, everyone you know is like, oh, well, you got to be money. So you bet. I mean, I, I'm going to be seeing like Oscar level films out of you. Like, you're like, um, all right. I mean, I'm just going to buy some sneakers, but whatever. So um, I think that the way that it was set up was really cool because I had the opportunity to just say, like, what do I want to do? Right. And so um, I, when I graduated college, was like really jealous of some of my friends, um, Tyler Benjamin and Mel uh, Melanie Burkich in particular, because they got to travel. And like, I think Tyler went and did like some work in Switzerland for a couple months and he was in Costa Rica and Melanie was all over the place and like Germany. And I was just really jealous, but I, know I didn't have any money to do that. Um, that wasn't like mad jealous them. I just was like, oh, like it'd be so cool to do this. And I'd always wanted to take like a, just a America cross country drive um just go to all the states i've always for some reason been really infatuated with the idea of um all of the states and how they're different and um i used to what, collect state quarters as a kid because those were cool remember when, remember when you go to the store and you'd be like oh no not that quarter can i have another one and the cashier's like yo there's like 800 people in line your eight-year-old needs to get out of here um and so i i had this idea about doing a, a project that was about like it was first called echo chamber you know you know, you come up with an idea you think is popping, and later you're like, this isn't good. Um, and the idea was that we move to places that validate our, like, political beliefs, or we stay in places that validate them. But instead, the project turned into something much better. It was called Stories from Here, and it was a series of micro-stories about, you know, what makes us human, what motivates us. And so my project idea was essentially, like, if I come up with questions, and I ask everyone the same questions, um, what can I find out about other people if I put them in like a magazine feature style piece, right? And so some of the questions were like, what does true freedom look like to you? What does your name mean and why are you given it? Um, who, are some, what, who are some fictional characters that um, you relate to, um, whether it's a novel or a book? Um, a lot of them were questions about self, sense of self, and then what brought them to this place. Um, and so some themes arose. So like when I, I went to Texas first, I went to Austin, San Antonio, and um, El Paso. And for whatever reason, if they're listening to this, Kim Libby, Christy, and Matt, um, thank you all so much for letting me stay with you when I was there. And then um, shout out to the El Paso family. But when I was in Texas, El Paso specifically, I tried to only speak to various stages of Mexican-American immigrants, whether they had been in, um, they have generations in America or just come over and they were older, just come over and they were younger. Um, because I wanted to understand the dichotomy of like how El Paso could be statistically one of the safest cities in America or the safest, but also be called a beachfront for immigration and like what that meant. So like somebody's lying. <laughs> it's one of the two, like either there's like gangs of cartels or nothing. And so it was really cool to kind of frame it through the eyes of other people. And I think that was a big pivot point for me. I learned a lot on that trip because I actually took the Amtrak down. So was, I couldn't be comfortable. I was just kind of rolling along the whole way, but um throughout the year i took i went to like providence um and i learned about and um and new haven and went to cities that had um what's the word cities that just had two different things like um i went to these two ivy league cities or towns because i was curious about how the ivy league impacted those towns and like you know what the what the effects were in the place um i went to one of my favorite ones i went to lake city florida and interviewed high school students that'd be the first students in their family to go to college and they were cool to do at the end because if this whole project's based on sense of place, but you're 17, you have no sense of place because you have no agency yet. Um, and so working with them was really cool to hear them talk about their poetry, hear them talk about like what impacted them and why. Um, the project was something that I was really thankful for because at the end there was like almost like a yearbook of this moment in time. Um, I also did this project about the train in New York that was kind of okay. Um, and then I did, um, I did the darker skin tones thing, which was, uh, so first of all, I never 
tweeted at Amy Blitz because I I just value not getting dragged. Like, look, I know it's cool to like dunk on her and stuff, but like she probably still has like a lot of influence. So like Annie, I never said anything about you. You have some amazing photographs that have influenced me in my lifetime. I just think that the way you desaturate generally leaves black people looking not great. Um, and because of the area you are in your career, you don't feel like you need to change. Um, I would like it, though, if Simone Biles didn't look like um, she was, like, turned into a, a baby Hulk. You know, it's just, it, it was strange. And so that's just my opinion. Other people happened to tweet it, um, and it had nothing to do with me. Um, I would never mess up my money by tweeting at a legend like that. But essentially what happened was I read this lovely article in The Hollywood Reporter um, about the folks in the, that work on lighting on Easter Race Insecure. They do a great job. And they talked about one thing they do, for example, is when they're shooting those club scenes, they use these LED lined lights that are just in like a linear line or excuse me, in a straight line. And they add them in um, just to make sure there's enough light on the subject without making it seem like it's, they're not in like a nightlife scenario. And so I thought it was really smart. So they talked about using pink and blue lights depending on the, like, the undertones of people. And so I was like, this is interesting. So I researched some more and I was like, oh. Um, and I was just realizing that a couple things were happening. There were a lot of photographers that I loved that like, you know, for, you know, algorithm reasons or whatever, weren't really shooting a lot of people of color. They just, whether they didn't know any or like whatever it was. And when you bring it up, people be like, oh, well, I don't really do it. So I don't really know how to do it. And like, at, once again, I bring up Dana Scruggs. She's right in saying it's not really different. It's just a little bit more attention to detail. And if you, if you are used to shooting only black people, then shooting white people will be weird. But the idea for me was just to say like, okay, if you said this is a hard thing to do, here are some very obvious things. So we talked about using a hair light. Um, we talked about when you're in Lightroom, like when we're like all preset like slaves and we love using them, like making sure that it doesn't alter people's skin in a crappy way. Using color makes in Lightroom. And like I give this tip all the time to people. If, you, if you're photographing like white people exercising and they're getting very red and very flushed, like just turn the red down on color mix just like you would the orange if you're using, using like a darker skinned person. And I promise you both people will look better. And you know what? That, that's something that I learned and now you can learn it. And so it's funny because what happens is every couple months, someone will take a bad picture of black people and someone will be like, oh, we'll read this. And then I got all these floods of mentions where I'm like, yo, like, and it's funny because it's funny when, like as the baby viral on Twitter, because I, at that point, wasn't really using Twitter. Literally, I wrote it. I wrote it for Adobe Create. Then Lightroom was like, oh, this is cool. Why don't we do like a feature on the Lightroom Instagram about it? I was like, okay, cool. So I was like, can y'all pay for the studio for me to shoot some people? I did that. And when I was doing that, um, I met this woman at Apple. Very long story. Um, I, I met this woman at Apple at a dinner, and um, she introduced me to someone else before she left Apple. And then I ended up doing a big talk about this whole thing. So it was like an Apple talk, the Instagram thing, or the Instagram thing. And somewhere in the middle of getting rid of the Apple talk, I was like, I guess I should tweet this. Like people use Twitter, like whatever. And I put it like just to let you know how little I tried. I put it out on like a like a Friday at like 6 p.m. Like it was just like, I just put it on, I didn't care. And then I went back on Twitter later and I was like, what is happening? And then like for two days, I just like couldn't use my Twitter. Um, but like every couple weeks, it'll, every couple of months, it'll like, that'll happen. And so I know for some people, 10,000 tweets doesn't seem like a lot, but retweets, but for me, it's a lot. Um, and so it's cool because a lot of people will be like, oh, I know your work because of that. Or like I, I was on set for United Shades and one of the PAs was like, dude, I've been following you for years and I first saw your work on this thing. And I was like, Oh, weird. Also, maybe not the time to bring this up, but like, appreciate it. Um, and it was cool. It was really, really cool. So, you know, I don't think that that should define my work, but I think that what should define my work is my like chase to make everything more accessible and easy to understand for people. I, or what I hope it does. And I love that you are aware enough to know what defines your work, you know, at this point, you know, in your, in your career, tell us about working on United Shades. Like what, what, what is your role in that? Like what, what is it like to, to be working on a show? Oh, absolutely. Um, first of all, let me say this. Um, I, for the most part, haven't had any bad celebrity interactions. I'm not telling you, I'm not like, a, not like a celebrity photographer. I just like take pictures of celebrities sometimes. Um, usually it's other black men. I think often like, um, these like folks that are shoot, that are choosing photographers want people that kind of have a similar background. Um, I actually got my first United Shades gig when I was during, during the residency. 
Um, I got an email from a woman named Tracy Crosby. She doesn't work at um, Turner anymore. So Turner, remember y'all, like when you're trying to find people that are hire you, they're subsidiaries and stuff. So like I think Turner uh, is, a, is like CNN's a subsidiary. Anyway, she works in the photo department. I just got an email from her that was like, hey, Andre, nice to meet you. I was in the Adobe office, like having a meeting in, in Union Square and like saw an email that was like, CNN photo shoot? And I was like, what? What's going on here? Um, and, you know, back when I really didn't know what was going on. And so I read this email and she was like, I work on the show. You know, we were trying to find new photographers. Would you be interested? Like, give me a call. And I was like, okay. So I called her like 30 minutes later and we talked. And she was like, yeah, you know, we've been trying to find a photographer and it hasn't really worked. Would you be interested? Um, and I've never shot set photography before. I've never even used a mirrorless. It's funny because now I have a, I actually just got this uh, R6, which is great. But the mirrorless, for the folks that are wondering, if you shoot set photography, you have to have a camera that um, doesn't make sound. So um, I, I shoot on my Mark IV all the time, but the Mark IV is not helpful here because it's a DSLR. That sound will pick up in all the interviews, and you'll be watching a show and you hear constantly, and someone you'll get thrown out. So my very first episode, I fly into Alabama. I had to cut this like trip I had short. Um, it was like it was a couple days after I talked to her on the phone. She was like, "All right, cool. Here's a contract. You're flying to Alabama." I was like, "Okay." Flew to Alabama, landed, got to the hotel, saw Kamal and his producer, and was like, "Hey, nice to meet you." And I think they just thought I was like some fan. Um, and they were like, "Whatever." And then in the morning, I was like, "Hey, what's up?" And they were like, "You got up to talk to us again?" And I was like, "No, I'm the set photographer." They're like, "Oh, okay." And that first episode was rough, man. The first scene we shot, it was a three camera shot, and I didn't know. I thought I only could see two cameras, and I walked into a long shot. And the editor, the director, pulled me inside and said, "If you ever do that again, I'm going to send you home." And I was terrified. And so, generally, what happens with set photography is like every show you watch, um, there's set photography. So it's like it's the images that you see for like watch, like Shameless. Like it'll just be like a cutout photo. Um, sometimes it's a photo that's like in a studio, but often it's like right on set. So there's a photographer who usually is almost shooting over the shoulder of the director of the photography or the camera people, because those are the only places you know that you can be where you're not in the shot. Because if like another camera person's in the shot, then everyone's unhappy. And so that first episode was a little scary. I only did two episodes that season. Um, that was 2017. In 2018, I did three episodes. So the first season I did that in Atlanta about HBCUs. Then the following year, I did um, three episodes. I did um, Philadelphia and Fishtown, where we learned about um, how much it sucks to be poor in America. It was about this area that um, people had gotten a lot of lead poisoning, you know, casual. And uh, we went to uh, Minneapolis for the first time and learned about the Hmong people. And it was so cool, like, um, just learning about that. And then we ended on Mormonism. And I met, like, the dude from Imagine Dragons, Imagine Dragons who was nice. He was really nice and very tall and learned about what it, how difficult it is for Mormon youth that are LGBTQ. Then last season, I did four episodes, and now this year I'm doing six out of eight. So there's a couple things. First, um, Kamal is super gracious. Um, you know, there are some celebrities that are nice because they understand that, like, everyone is trying to do their job. Like, I remember Jesus and Miro in New York are very, very kind. Um, Karamo is very kind. Anil Burris is very kind. There are people that are respectful because it's your job and there are people that don't want to be there and so being able to read that is important um and being able to communicate is important the thing about that job especially is like normally like i said i run the show so the photos that i want to take are the photos i want to take but here nope it's it oh do we have three minutes okay andre you can go shoot you can you can grab come out and shoot him oh no hey we said you had three minutes you have no time um so sometimes you miss stuff sometimes you get stuff but my job is essentially to take photos of him in each scene, take photos of the scene, take BTS of them setting up, as well as images of all the subjects. And then um, as it's progressed, it's gotten really cool. Last year, my favorite episode, we got to go to Oklahoma, learned all about what it was like to be a black farmer. Um, and it was just like a beautiful, beautiful episode where I just learned about how difficult it was for farmers in general to get the funding they needed and all the things they had to do to just like live their lives. And like me trying not to slip in like manure and mud while photographing was a whole other thing. But I think the real trick is like finding someone like I really like truly like Kamau and I, I consider us friends now. Like it's just, you know, my, my mom made him dinner. Like that's, you know, that's as, that's as good as we're going to get. And like for me, having someone who is validated as a, a voice of, you know, reason 
um, and as an influential voice saying, no, 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 I want you here. Like this, especially this last season, every episode that I've been, I'd share photos, come out would retweet and say like, Andre's the best photographer I know. He's amazing human, like all this stuff. And like that, that really matters because like I said, we're talking about visibility, like that helps me get other jobs, but it also just validates my ability to do my job well. Um, that show is really beautiful in that it's like the much more adult version of that project stories from here I did where it's like we're gonna go learn and Kamal is essentially a professional listener so we sit on set and we just listen to people talk about their experiences remember last year like there's a couple like wow moments I remember last year we were doing an episode of Iranian Americans I was stuck in the corner of this like um brownstone and what were um in Long Island City and Queens and the guy who used to be the ambassador to Iran was talking about being kept hostage. I'm literally standing in this corner like I have no business being in this conversation, right? And I'm just like a fly on the wall listening to this man discuss like what it was like to be trapped in this place and lose all this weight. And like, I think that, I mean, photography has taken me so many places, truly, like the NBA draft and like um, going to Oklahoma in the middle of nowhere learning about farmers that like every time I get to hear a cool story like that, and since I'm not the I'm not the center stage here, I get just get to hang out and listen. Um, it's like it's so cool. Like I essentially get paid by CNN to go listen to amazing things. It, it's like it's such a like it'll blow. It just blows your mind. Well, don't don't discount the fact that um, you aren't just listening. I mean, but, but oh, no, no, I yeah. actually no, yeah. actually I have to do my job. With you. <laughs> it would it would fire me. But, but it's I, the be, I, the benefit. I like it. Yeah, no, the benefit of the, I mean, that's what's so amazing about whether it's portrait photography, whether it's an editorial, commercial, personal projects, like you are connecting with people in a way and, and learning from them in the process of creating imagery and in the process of documenting moments in time. And, you know, and I think those of us who are drawn to photography, filmmaking, you know, all of it, it it's you know, these are the things that get us so excited and, and fulfill us personally, in addition to, you know, it, it being work as well. Um, oh, no, it's, I mean, it doesn't, it, it doesn't always feel like work. And I really mean this, I'm very thankful. Like, sometimes you work on stuff and, you know, people really don't care whether you live or die, to be honest. Um, there is a Ben Staples lyric I think about a lot, the song Tweakin' that's very, very poetic for right now. Um, Oh no, it's not. It's not tweaking. It's and I like it is. But he was like, "You'd kill me if it make you richer." So what are you saying? You're my brother for like that's very, very real. Like there are a ton of people that just they follow you around you for the opportunity to take what you have. And on some level, that's completely fine. It's capitalism. It is what it is. And I'm not saying that's our best situation, but you know we're gonna work through it. But um, I do appreciate on a set like that. Like the directors are great. Helen Cho. She used to direct the Anthony Bourdain show, and she listens and asks me my opinion like this woman who has no i don't like i don't matter she's like tv famous you know she's directed such beautiful things and um i like being in situations like that where you, everyone is given value and does their job it's just it's a nice reminder of what we what the world can be like if we have a little bit less ego beautifully said andre uh i have one final question for you Ooh, um, i love it. talking about you know, you're talking about sense of place, sense of self. What does your name mean? And why were why were you given it um, oh, from your, your Jamaican Yo, parents? Going back to your, your Adobe residency project. Yo, my mom has never given me a clear answer, ever, right? She just was like, yeah, you know, like I, you know, it was a little bit easier. I, I just wanted it to be unique. I don't, I still like truly do not know. I still get anxiety at times i think everyone has heard me say my name now and i've just it's been so it's honestly been good for the internet like but people will be like how'd you get your instagram also please can someone help me get twitter andre like i love that guy he's a really nice man but he's like a 50 year old man who tweets about the cowboys and he has like 20 followers like bro give me my twitter handle please um but you know when i was a kid i was like dread a substitute you should be like oh andre or whatever other dumb way you could possibly say my name um but I appreciate it now because it like helps me stand out and it's, I'm easier to find. Um, but my mom never really gave me a clear, a clear answer. There's no other Andres. I know that my older cousin's name is Antonio and it almost feels like they were on the stretch where they were trying to give like these like, <laughs> like Latin names to us. I don't know why. And, um, you know, my, all my Latin, all my Spanish teachers in high school are going this, but, um, I think Andre is a cool name. Like I've, I've come to really, really, um, 
appreciate it. It's short, it you know, it works, but there's there's not really any sort of clarity as to what it means. It's just a variation of Andrew, which just means man. So um, as long as I, my gender identity stays that it is, it's reasonably accurate. Um, but yeah, no, it's a bummer. People would always ask me that, like, oh, wow, you asked me, can I tell you? And I, can you tell me? And I was like, I have nothing to tell you. Um, I have one more point um, that I just want to make sure anyone that's listening hears is um, whatever you have access to right now is the story that you need to tell. Um, practice with that and you'll get better. After I did stories from here and struggled in some points, I got, like, I'm wearing this sweater because I work with North Face now a lot. Um, and last year they let me go to the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge to do story tell about what it's like to live there and why we should protect it. And, you know, a couple of years ago when I was a resident, the culminating project I did was the stories from here with the Golden State Warriors where I got to feature fans. And I went to the game and I was like, the videos I made were on the, or the I made with Adobe War and the Jumbotron. And I was so overwhelmed. I like didn't know how I felt about it. I just like couldn't think. It was just, like it was so it was just there's so much happening. And the second time something like that happened, we finished that show and or finished shooting that stuff for North Face. We went to DC and we got to show work to lawmakers and see them just say, Oh, okay. Oh, you brought us a book? Oh, we can see some photos of this region. Oh, there's some witch in people here to talk about it as they swipe through Andre's photos. Oh, we have these giant prints before our face. Like I didn't let myself worry about how I felt because this time I said, well, this is about these people and that's what my job is here. Um, and so practice with the people that are around you to learn the stories that you like to tell the most and then get ready to, to shoot in other ways. But if you're interested in it, like there's nothing stopping you um, except for the fact that photography is expensive. And so, you know, if you need to borrow something, I'm sure we'll figure it out. But just as much as you can, whatever is available to you, that's my biggest advice. Chase that. I love it. Thank you for the final words. Andre, it's been such a pleasure to have you on today. Thank you so much um, for your time. And uh, I want to make sure everybody knows where to follow you, find you. We've said it a few times throughout, but give us all the places. Oh, okay. So first of all, uh, the best tweet I ever saw was that Twitter is my Finsta. And I agree with that. I do not have a fake Instagram or a Finstagram. But Twitter is where I speak a little bit more clearly about how I feel. So there you can find me at, at Andre LaRoe, so A-U-N-D-R-E, um, L-A-R-R-O-W. I'll ask for Creative Live to hit me with a retweet so the folks can see that. Um, on Instagram and Behance, it's at A-U-N-D-R-E. Um, for Instagram, it's you know, obviously polished work, but on my Instagram TV as well as on Behance, I've been streaming with Behance to explain how I do things on Lightroom. I want to do that so that um, anyone that's confused about how to do things, they can learn them earlier. They're for the 15-year-old me. Um, and those are kind of the three places you'll find me, Instagram and Behance at Andre. Oh, on YouTube too, but it's the same videos. You can find them. And then um, on Twitter at Andre LaRoe. And at some point we will get that at Andre on Twitter, but you know, I won't hold my breath. Well, if everybody listening to this tweets at Andre and says, give it to LaRoe, Andre LaRoe, there you go. Maybe we'll have, maybe we can do something there. <laughs> Um, um, we'll do we can. But really, thank you um, for giving me time, for being patient with me. I know I had to like kind of move us around a little bit, um, but it's really, really cool. Like you, you, y'all do a lot of work, and you specifically do a lot of work. I physically met you, and then I've seen you all over the internet doing all these things. So, well, I'll it's work. our it's our pleasure, and uh, maybe we can get you to do some classes on Creative Live. Just gonna put that plug in there, my friend. Put uh, that plug in. Cool. <laughs> um, cool. Long-term relationships with anybody. I'm just out here doing my thing. Awesome. Um, thank you, everybody, for tuning in today. Uh, this has been another episode of our podcast, We Are Photographers. We're closing in on 100 episodes. So be oh. sure to go out and um, check out wherever you listen to your Get Your Podcast. Search for We Are Photographers. Search for Creative Live. You'll find it. Subscribe. Uh, you can also go listen to all those past episodes on creativelive.com slash podcast. All right, everybody, that's a wrap for today, but we will see you next time right here on Creative Live TV. Thank you, Andre.